Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our first critical conversation of 2022. My name is Hayatun Sillam, and I'm the Chief Executive of the Royal Academy of Engineering and the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering. And over the course of our critical conversation series, I've had the very good fortune to be joined by some exceptional speakers to explore and debate issues of critical importance to the global engineering community and wider society. And today we'll be continuing that with a conversation about what works in diversity and inclusion. Anybody who knows me will know that this is a topic I'm very passionate about. It's a personal priority, but it's also a professional priority for me as Chief Exec of the Academy. The evidence base for the business benefits of diverse teams working in inclusive cultures is now overwhelming, from talent, recruitment, retention, motivation, to creativity and innovation, to productivity, health and safety, to the ability to reach new markets and produce products that actually work. I could go on, but I'm sure you get the picture. And while there is evidence that the diversity and inclusivity of engineering and of tech is improving, we also need to recognise that today there are still many groups, too many groups, whose voices and perspectives risk being underrecognised, undervalued and underrepresented. The Academy's overarching goal is to harness the power of engineering to build a sustainable society and an inclusive economy that works for everyone. And as part of our commitment to creating that inclusive economy, our diversity and inclusion programme is exploring ways to accelerate the rate of change on DI and in engineering. And to do that, we need to be evidence led. We need to understand what works. So I'm really delighted to be joined this evening by two leading voices on diversity and inclusion who are really well placed to help me explore this topic. Anne Marie Neatham is Partnership Director at Acardo Group and CEO at Kindred, a robotics and AI company acquired by Acardo Group in 2020. Anne-Marie leads the organisational development of and integration of Kindred into the Ocado Group organisation. She's a software engineer by background and has worked in a variety of countries. She was appointed Chief Operating Officer at Ocado Technology in 2014, looking after infrastructure and operations, organisational development and general management. She led Ocado's Code for Life initiative, now used by over 160,000 children, which is a free and comprehensive teaching resource for coding in primary schools. She's been listed as one of the UK's top 100 women to watch by Cranfield University and has been included in the Computer Weekly's list of most influential women in IT. Delighted to have you here today, Anne-Marie. And Dr. Karen Salt is Deputy Director for Research, Culture and Environment at UKRI. Karen has over 27 years worth of experience working in and with communities, organisations, charities and governmental bodies. An expert on systems and transformative change, she has led and managed research centres, large research teams and research projects, including those involving community members as active researchers and those exploring the governance of technology deployed for the public good. Now based in UKRI, she has a very important role as Deputy Director for R&D Culture and Environment, where she drives UKRI's cross-organisational strategic thinking and policy making on research integrity, equality, diversity and inclusion, open research and culture. And she also, as if that wasn't enough, leads UKRI's internal and external programme of work on mitigating risks and managing threats to international collaborations and partnerships. So welcome, Karen, as well. Um, we have two fantastic speakers, and I want to just kick off the discussion um, by asking you, why does diversity and inclusion matter to you? Okay. Can I start with you, please, Anne-Marie? Hi, thank you. We didn't know which to start with. So mm -hmm. you can tell by my accent, I'm Irish by birth, and I went to university and did a degree in computer science like 30 years ago now. And I went to an all-girls school and then joined a university with all of six girls in a class, full of a lecture theatre full of men, full of men of a certain type, geeky, dorky, that's all I can call them, lovely, lovely guys. But again, even in a white Ireland, there was no diversity of thought or people in that room. I actually thought there must be a different room for the girls to go into for the first day and then realised this just was not true. What's bad about that story is I kind of went, well, it must be a bit abnormal here and sort of ignored it in real life as I went to, on to become a software engineer and worked with mostly men all the time. And then you actually study the data. 
you realize that all of 16% of graduates of computer science are women at, in the UK at the moment, and it's lower in other countries. It's just awful. And that's terrible because of the implications. We're all on technology now. Lots of that technology, including my phone, suits a man's hand better than it suits my hand, which is just crazy. And the world is going to become ever, ever more dependent on technology. AI, you know, machine learning, visual systems can benefit everyone, but only if everyone is at the party, if you like. So I, I, I care about it passionately because I think for a long time I was unaware of the fact that I was pretty unusual having come out of a school. I had no idea that girls didn't do these roles. Nobody told me. And I know there are hundreds of other people with various other, you know, backgrounds, also some people with various different disabilities or anything else that they limit themselves and don't realize world changing stuff is something they should be a part of and have every right to be involved in. And that's it. So I feel pretty passionately about it. Thank you, Amory. Yes, we can we can hear that passion coming <laughs> through. And I think probably relate to it too. Karen, could you also tell us why is this so important to you? Ooh, I think this is a, a good question. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I, I'll, I'll tell a tiny bit of a personal story and then um, and, and link it in. Um, I, you know, for me, I've, I've had loads of different backgrounds and, and work and, and research and careers. Um, but I think I've always uh, pretty consistently, I think, across a number of different domains and spaces, um, been the only black woman in, in a room, um, uh, sometimes the only black woman at a university, sometimes the only black woman in a department. Um, and, and this has been from community development work uh, all the way through to working across government and, and various other spaces. So it's not something that's that, you know wholly dependent for engineers or only about research and innovation or, or there's, there's a special magic place where women like me are hanging out, right? So I, uh, but, that, but people are, um, they've led brilliant lives. They've invented and made fantastic things. And I think the point you raised earlier about maybe not valuing, valuing and recognizing that um, is, is significant. And so I, I, I've really tried to be in various spaces and think quite clearly and carefully, whose shoulders am I standing on? Um, who are the folks who... Um, you know, may not have got to that place where they had a DR behind their, uh, in front of or behind their names, um, but, uh, but have been producing and making brilliant things. How do we recognize that brilliance um, of all types of flavors and perspectives um, and, and also uh, continue to galvanize ourselves to move forward um, so that I don't, I don't, I try not to sit with the frustration and the worry of being the only or the, or the limited instead of it's more how do I use my privilege to be able to create more opportunity and, and to have those histories well known and recognized. So, you know, for me, this may sound cheesy, but for me, diversity and inclusion means hope. Um, I mean, most specifically, um, uh, hopeful for a different future, for a different now, for different systems. Um, but it also means joy. Because when we create those sorts of spaces, um, the ama magical, wonderful things happen. They, they, they're not an add-on or a thing that you think about only if you had special rainbows, right? It's just sort of like, imagine the transformed world if everybody can flourish um, and contribute uh, innovative ideas. Um, why would that be a bad thing? So uh, I, I tend to live in that hope and joy space as much as possible, even when I'm frustrated, uh, even when I'm stressed, um, because the potential, the, the, the transformative opportunity is so magnificent um, that, uh, that, it, that, you know, DNI for me is not a problem. DNI for me is, is a magical possibility. Um, and, uh, and the more we anchor that into the, our realities around our organizations, the better. Thanks so much, Karen. That's really powerful. And as a natural optimist, I can definitely relate to that, that mindset. Um, I should say to our audience that we absolutely want to have your questions and comments. Please do get involved. Submit your questions at any time. We're going to start off with a bit of a conversation amongst the panel, um, but we'll turn to your questions. and We'll try and get through as many of them as possible once we've done that. So having established is something that we uh, all feel very committed to. I'm guessing that you might also share a sentiment that I've had um, many times in these past few years, which is a sense of impatience, because 
whilst I think that the case for diversity inclusion is much better understood and better accepted than it was certainly when I was first getting involved in this, I think that we still have a long way to go to get to a rate of change where we can feel really positive about what's happening. So I would like to ask you, in your experience, what works well? Where have you actually seen delivering that positive change to enhance diversity and, and, and inclusivity? And if there are any specific examples you can give, so much the better. And Karen, this time I'll start with you and then come to Anne-Marie afterwards. So Karen, would you like to kick off? Uh, great. Um, thank you for this. This is this is one of those juicy questions, um, uh, and and often a, a, the the unfair question where I would I would I would be talking to you know maybe a, a minister or a head of an organization, and they're like, there has to be some place where where this is working. Can you tell us where it's working? Um, and I usually try to be a bit more blunt and say, it isn't. <laughs> it is usually temporarily fixing and working on a whole set and range of problems. But if we're talking about, um, you know, the sort of root causes of all of this, we're not, we haven't magically got rid of sexism. We haven't magically made racism not exist in the society. Um, we've, we've not gotten rid of ableism. Um, so we, we are often talking about symptoms or things that we see in places of work that are that or, or places where people gather um, or the work that they produce and and they will be brilliant some of them can be absolutely fantastic but I think for me that transformation is societal right it's systems based it's it's it's, it's encoded in all that we're doing as opposed to I want my business to be better and and only in this very narrow space um, am I thinking about um, uh, making change and transformation now. I, that that puts a lot of pressure on all of us, right? Uh, because we don't we can't take on sometimes these monumental, gigantic sets of problems. Um, so I I tend to break it into into a, a couple of spots. The so first for me in terms of what works is the, this question of curiosity. Um, you know, we we need to be able to be curious. The same curiosity that would allow us to invent and create things is the same curiosity we take to these questions of diversity and inclusion. Why, what, for what reason, for which group, in what way, what's the context? And really starting to explore that um, and, and get underneath that. Um, but that also comes with this bigger question of creativity. Um, we, have, we, we tend sometimes to be a, a society that loves uh, immediate solutions. Um, so we might bring in somebody for three months that might bring, create an action plan, and then we rush to do the action plan, evaluate whether or not it worked, and then go, look, I've done this, I've ticked that box, and, and we can now keep moving forward. Um, when really, in, in a lot of ways, we need to be much more creative in terms of what we're, what we're uh, faced with and dealing with, and not just buy a kit off the shelf or bring in a kind of plan, um, and, and actually think about this, and I'll, 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 I'll save this for what I hope will be a question about a measurement and evaluation and rigor. Um, but I also think that we need to be, we need to have a drive to understand. Um, uh, you know, my, my understanding of the world will not be the same as another person who identifies as a black woman. So we can't try, try to take the two knowledges that might have and they universalize to a, a, a whole set of things, but we also can't be so additive. We've tended to, I think, overwhelmingly, both as a, as a research and innovation sector, but, but other places, to go, this is now we will work on women. Now we will work on the people with a declared disability. Here we will now work on this group. And we don't actually think from a systems perspective. We don't, we're not thinking from that really holistic, what's, what's, what's happening across the wider piece and, and what might be affecting another group when you're ultimately trying to transform the experiences um, uh, for, for somebody else. Um, and so we need to really start thinking at that systems level. It's what we're trying to do quite a lot in our organization, but, but, but it's, it's what I do in interaction uh, globally as well, um, is to think what type of systems analysis do we need to put in place? How do we, how do we deeply start to understand the interconnectedness across a whole range of areas? Um, and, and then how do we collaborate? How do we actually start to do collaborative practice in a way that um, uh, elevates my knowledge, elevates your knowledge, because we're actually trying to bring those things together um, in terms of moving forward. So, uh, you know, curiosity, bit creativity, um, and then that drive to understand will take us a, a, a long way, um, I think, towards uh, really starting to understand what works. 
Thank you very much, Karen. Um, that's, that's really insightful. And Anne-Marie, if I can turn to you, you know, accepting that this is an area where there are no quick fixes and these are shared societal systemic challenges. What, in your experience, have you seen that is successful? What can we build on that's been successful? To an extent, I'm with Karen. It's very difficult to look at something and go, that's been wonderfully successful. I think in business, we've gotten better at doing the things or starting to certainly in ACADO because we are measuring. We're trying to go for the global equality standard and we will go for that this year. It's a definite aim. We wrote, wrote it down and we've made sure everybody's aware of it within the organization. We've been super careful because, as Karen said, the latest thing about diversity, can it can turn into a trend this week. It's this group of people next week. And we decide there's a beginning, middle and an end. And again, there's no system in place. We feel that the systems to get those systems in place that will be useful in terms of measurement, because you, we can get this award and lose it the following year quite easily because it'll become like a project. We don't want it to be a project. So we've been very careful not to just hand it to HR or the people team and make it into something one group of people do. It's been across the board in terms of the senior team with groups of people in different areas, some of it self-selecting. We found that to be pretty effective. And the reason we think it's effective is that, you know, there's a group in the US very particularly who in the end was the technology people who drove it, which really surprised us. And we've now introduced, you know, weekly lessons about understanding privilege, understanding. And people have been shocked about how little they genuinely knew about the other person in the room. And you have to remind people that they don't know about, uh, you know, what's happening to the other person in the room, what their experiences have been. I mean, I've been lucky. I, I've worked in lots of different places. And you realize that, you know, you need, we constantly ask people to let us know what makes them feel at home and what makes them feel comfortable? Because you can't be creative if you don't have that piece. And for companies, you're crazy if you've got a bunch of people in your, in your working environment who are basically just taking a salary, if you like, every month and hoping to God Friday comes quickly, as opposed to people who can genuinely contribute. And you contribute when you're comfortable what makes the environment comfortable? What do you need as an individual? And merging all of those individual pieces together. And we found it comes pretty close. And we have three pillars, which I'll read. Diversity, equality, inclusivity. You could ignore those three pillars because everybody has them. It's like, da, 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 don't they look nice? But actually just having them and constantly reinforcing them mm -hmm. in all of those groups across your organization is definitely helping us. Again, it needs to be evolutionary, but it needs to be much more of a revolution type of evolution. Otherwise, we'll never get there. Will be hundreds of years, hundreds of years time. It'll never get to be something that matters. You know where it's going to matter terribly is for organisations. When you are seeking talent, you need all of your talent to be able to contribute to your organisation, and there is not enough talent out there. And many there is enough talent, but there aren't enough. There isn't enough talent being used and accessed in a lot of industry. And if you see, it you know. It really is terribly important as an organization. And I do view it totally from the industry perspective. If you want your organization to be successful, it cannot be a dinosaur. It must always be part of the revolution. And the best way to ensure that and the best way to be creative and push stuff forward is to make sure you have a diversity of thought. And to get a diversity of thought, you have to have a diversity in your population. It all falls down from one thing to another. And it has to be critical and it will always matter. It cannot be a project. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Again, um, really, really great insights. And I always quite like, there are lots of definitions of inclusion, but one of the ones I quite like, it talks about the, the balance and the coexistence of your sense of uniqueness and, and personal identity sitting comfortably alongside that sense of belonging within the organisation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's one thing that, that you're describing. And I and also really liked sort of the, the sense of humility that comes through. I think you know, we can't be committed to diversity inclusion if we don't start from a place of humility. And also that, that, that point around proactively seeking to listen and understand different perspectives. We can't be reduced to a set of buckets. You need to be able to count things. We're going to come on to that in a second. But um, actually to, to remember that we can, we can build a sense of empathy by learning more about each other and, and how the world looks from our different vantage points. So anyway, gosh, we must keep going. There's so much to get through. Um, so one of the reasons that I believe so strongly that diversity and inclusion really matter for engineering and tech in particular 
is because our communities are designing and delivering products, systems, infrastructure that people right across society use all the time. They literally shape our world. They shape how we interact with it. I would love to have your thoughts on how engineers and designers can ensure that the products and systems that they develop are actually inclusive and really you know, do what they're supposed to do. They meet the needs of all users. So, Amory, I'm going to come to you first and then I'm going to come to Karen. I guess that there's a few. Uh, one in their development employ a diverse group of people to develop them in the first place because you get kind of you get out what you put in and 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 measure it so you know one of the things you mentioned code for life that I was involved in since 2014 we actually have over 350,000 kids and teachers registered on it now and it was to try to make sure because it's a free resource it's still available it will remain available it follows the UK's um uh uh, computer science curriculum um all the way through to I think to key stage three or four now and it's super important because it opens the doors for lots more kids in the longer term. And this, again, is not a project. It's a long term initiative that's been going since 2014. This is eight years later. And I'd like to see it go for another 20 or 30 years and be completely changed at that point. But you have to start with a foundation and involve, again, more people because they're the feeder system. And that will take, you know, in eight years, I don't doubt that we have gotten, uh, you know, a more diverse group of people interested in doing computer science through to university because of this and other initiatives that other companies are doing as well. You have to pull in that talent early in terms of action. And it matters more, you know, your own stuff. You really get it. You understand it more. You can you make sure that it is exactly works the way you need it to work. There's other areas. Um, obviously, our website, we try to make sure it's at, you know, it's level A in, in um, W3C, you know, to make sure accessibility. It's very difficult to keep that going. You've got to decide who's going to use it, what your target is, what bits, because there's some compromise. Again, it's not an individual project. You keep having to build. We have never reached a stage where we're entirely happily happy that the site is, you know, usable by everybody. But we try really, really hard and put a lot of effort and money behind it to diversify in that area also. And guess what? That benefits your business also. And then another area which I'm very, very interested in, and it's a forward looking area. And it is that piece that's just over the horizon. Um, ACADA was involved a few years ago in the Horizon 2020 project across uh, Europe and um, the UK in various different universities. And our use cases for robots were collaborative robots, secondhand robots working with human beings. And for us, it was working in warehouses, it's picking up groceries. So, you know, if you can pick up 56,000 different items of all different shapes and sizes, from a pen to a six pack of Evian water to whatever it is, some of those robots that the universities are taking forward, exactly the same application could potentially add an arm to a wheelchair. That would improve somebody's life immeasurably. It also improves the lives of carers and also potentially carers and typically people with disabilities can often be so disadvantaged. You can never get in there and play your part in the world. And I am so hopeful, you know, as Karen has mentioned, this hope, it's always hope because those technologies, if enough and a wide, the widest possible diversity of people are involved in the development of those robots, they will work better for a wider group of people. Could you imagine as we, if, as we all age and we've seen our parents age and everything else, and if a robot could help them with daily functions and stuff, it really improves dignity. I just see great hope in technology but that will work better with more people involved. And it's not just an engineering role. It's a medical role. It's a nursing role. It's a physiotherapist's role. It's everybody's role. Fantastic, Amory. And that's, you know, bring us back to this idea of the, the opportunity provided by inclusion, not just the constraint to <laughs> trying to get better at it. So Karen, I'd love your thoughts on this too, please. Um, thanks. And a uh, really rich conversation. I mean, I, I, obviously, I could talk about seatbelts that don't fit, uh, you know, certain body types or um, soap dispensers that don't see uh, darker skin tone. Um, and, and we've got so I think I think you know, the, the audience um, and, and listeners will 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 know and be able to turn to um, similar uh, sort of issues. Um, but I think, you know, when we, when I think about this question, um, I'm actually really motivated by um, the conversation so far with Anne Marie um, about two two critical things actually, um, and then I've, I've got some specifics. One is that um, 
really, really doing diversity and inclusion and, uh, and actually embedding, embedding it in your systems um, and your processes is a change management program. Um, uh, it's, it's not just, I want to talk to a few people about how they're feeling, or I want to, I want to, I want to create opportunities for others. It, it, it is absolutely that to a certain extent. Um, but it's also those questions around how do you, how, it's not just how do you, how do you invite people to, into the room or to the table, um, uh, or through the door. Um, I often say that the key is whether or not anybody wants to be at the party. Right. Um, uh, and, and, and how do you really get underneath that? So but to do that work and to do it at a systems level where it's not dependent upon individuals to tell you about the barriers that they're experiencing um, or their frustrations or you piecemeal trying to bring in a few people of X background into certain sets of places and spaces when you really are trying to fundamentally make inclusion by design right, from the very beginning, the very first moment you start to have an idea about something um, and collaboratively co-develop and, and, and take that all the way through to, you know, user testing and products and, and engagement and interaction. Um, that is a lot of change management work where you might in, encounter resistance. It might be hard to figure out how to resource it and to try to understand it. Um, and it's not magically solved because you hire an engagement or a diversity and inclusion officer um, or you create a couple of, you know, some, some really rigorous plans. And I, and I think, that, you know, it's, it's, it's quite important for most organizations to reckon with this um, because they'll, they'll, they'll want to see impact quite quickly um, by, by then starting to do work. But often we're not actually trying to change and manage that change. Um, uh, we're trying to do some of the transformation, but transformation is really hard. Um, and, and it's hard at systems level, which any engineer will know and actually talk about that. But we're not applying the same kind of thought to thinking about diversity and inclusion um, uh, and, and the type of work. Um, uh, so for me, you know, there's, there's some key things. Don't universalize, especially with faulty data. That's often problematic. Um, uh, Co-develop uh, as, as much as possible. Um, spend time with the various communities that you're going to be working with. Um, better yet, uh, employ them as researchers um, uh, and have them actually play a role as opposed to just testing stuff people do much later down the line. Um, and, and actually, I'm a really big fan of the design fiction. Um, I, I think it's a really useful tool and, and structure, but one that's actually based on the real world um, is, is actually super important as opposed to a storyboard that somebody puts together of their magic person that they've imagined. Um, and I'll give you an example of, of, of um, uh, from my knowledge from a while ago about the success of this. Uh, people were working on um, uh, a, a rebuild of a, of a hospital um, that was going to be mostly a, a critical care unit that was going to work with a lot of wheelchair users. Um, so instead of imagining this, this sort of space of the future and various other things and putting together, I mean, they, they were doing that, but they actually decided to actually um, give a camera to a wheelchair user uh, and to go through spaces um, uh, that were aligned to the current hospital. And they actually started to see what their world looked like from that user's perspective. Um, the height of things, the way the rooms looked, the way people looked, where people came, how they had to congregate and move around. And suddenly you have a situation in the hands of the person that is so useful for, for people who are doing any further design work. Now, it's easy for us to think about certain sets of situations where we might just roll that out, but to make that universal so that that becomes the, just the norm of how you do stuff um, across various different domains and not, I don't deal with people, so I don't have to worry about this. Um, that's not the type of engineer I am. We really need to get past all of that um, and actually think, you know, get to those fundamental, what are those problems? What are the questions? What are we, what are we producing? What are we making? Who is it benefiting and what role are they playing moving forward? So anyway, the bit of the big picture and then some specificity. And I'm, I'm hopeful that gave you a little bit of an insight to my thinking on this. Definitely, no, two really excellent contributions. Actually, Karen, it, it reminds me that one of the things I still feel is underutilized is the kind of is, is the tools offered by gamification to help us yeah. build that empathy mm -hmm. with different groups, different, literally different perspectives. Yeah. And that's such a great example of how that can be done without fancy technology. Um, super cool. Right. So I'm going to start trying to bring in um, audience questions because we are having such a great conversation. I don't want to forget our <laughs> audience out there. And uh, Sunil Jindal has asked us, um, he asked Karen specifically, but I reckon, Anne-Marie, you will have interesting insights on this too. 
how do you recommend companies measure inclusion? So I wanted to definitely talk about measurement. I mean, you talked about change programs. If I think of what's the biggest, most system-wide, um, sector-wide change program I've seen that has made measurable progress, I probably would say health and safety in our world. And there you can see measurable reduction in the um, fatalities, in the incidents. Um, so it's been a very important part of how how not just the change has happened, but the change has been evidenced and in turn driven further progress. But it, how do you measure inclusion is a really interesting nuance on that wider set of, you know, what, what should you be measuring diversity and inclusion? So Karen, let me come to you first. But anne I'd love any thoughts from you as well. And please, audience, yes. keep your questions coming. Uh, it's a great question. Thank you very much for that one. Um, and I, I, you know, I, if, if we use the point about health and safety, we can also go to the, to the dark days of health and safety where it was frustrating mm-hmm. and difficult uh, and problematic to actually have the culture change. Um, and for me, there's this uh, <clears throat> real tension that we've got between compliance monitoring culture um, around diversity and inclusion um, and, and actual cultural transformation. Um, and, and, and sustainable, you know, systems impacted cultural transformation. And these are, they can be enablers to a certain extent, these, these sorts of processes, um, but they can't be the only thing that you're ultimately doing. Um, because again, if it turns out you've got a fantastic monitoring system uh, to evaluate and assess, and nobody wants to be in the job and everyone is leaving and, and people aren't being promoted or there's no progression. Um, you know, a whole bunch of Anne-Marie's points about bringing in the, the talented people and actually allowing them to flourish in spaces. I mean, these are the types of things that are often quite difficult for uh, organizations and, and, um, and uh, to measure and try to understand. Um, so I, I probably have just a, a few quick points. Maybe the, we can see if we can, pick these up later, wants to try to really figure out what the problem is. I think, I think I'm, I'm, I'm often quite fascinated that the problem statement hasn't really been declared in, in, in situations. It's usually either too gigantic, like I want to, I want to do something, you know, I want, to, I want Karen to not have curly hair, right? Um, well, there's ways for me to not have curly hair, but that's not a problem. That's not my problem. I'm quite happy with my curly hair. So people trying to solve my curly hair is the wrong, you know, it's, the, it's asking, the, it's, it's focused on the wrong problem um, because it's not the one that I, 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 I am identifying. Um, we need to figure out ways of developing. Um, and, it, and it's interesting that it's a monitoring evaluation is, and, and I'm really thinking about, you know, still trying to develop the type of stuff we're here. We can think about all this when it comes to people, but when we're actually starting to think about interventions or we're talking about systems, we do have to think about how do we develop these things? Where do they come from? Who gets to participate in them? Um, we have to do the testing. We need to actually properly do testing and experimentation. Um, because no one has the magical solution across all of this. And then we actually need to harness that information. There's so much data that sits on people's shelves across various different things that they've done, um, across, especially across organizations, that that knowledge just isn't, is, it isn't captured in a way that other people can pick up, except for the report at the end of a successful project, um, which you can go to, not the one that didn't work, right? Um, the, the, the next is, uh, for me, is monitoring. And really thinking about monitoring in a really rigorous way um, that isn't just a people survey to get to get a sense of did people, are, you know, are you satisfied with this? But really starting to understand what the sort of information that would be useful and, and significant evaluation. Um, and we need to be creative with eva- evaluation and really starting to understand, are we assessing these actual interventions and, and, and the solutions themselves? Or are we looking at something else? And it's fine if we're looking at something else, but we'll be really clear about that. Um, and for me, monitoring and evaluation is this is this secret place to unlock DNI. Um, if we if you do that really with that same rigor and commitment and that creativity and experimentation, taking the same stuff that engineers take to their to their work to the DNI space, we'll end up with a really robust, rich set of data um, uh, that goes beyond just Likert scales of whether or not people are satisfied with their work environment, which are nice, they're helpful but they don't necessarily get you at that systems question that we've been really posing. Um, And I think there's some transformational potential here to really start to think about monitoring and evaluation um, uh, at a systems level. Thank you, Karen. I I really like your distinction, which is something I think some of us can fall victim to um, between the the sort of um, 
focus on how people feel. So inclusion is about how people feel, but yep. you're pushing us hard to say measure inclusive outcomes. I think that's such an important distinction. Um, Anne-Marie, I'd love to have your thoughts, but I'm going to be mean and throw in an additional question because I want to try and get through as many as possible. Uh, so Helen Ledbetter is asking if you've got any best practice to share regarding recruitment processes so that you can be as inclusive as possible in that aspect of how we operate in our companies and organisations. So Anne-Marie, uh, uh, welcome your comments. Thank you. So, so for the first but I think um, I, I think a major piece is as well is not to be afraid to start because I think I was you know it's it's we really, can feel it's so big it's so scary I don't know who I can ask gathering data well ask people and see what they'll let you tell you to do I, I think people are terribly afraid sometimes to measure this stuff because they can look around and go make some assumptions half of which they'll discover were wrong afterwards anyway but you need to ask the questions and try not to be afraid of it. Um, there is a danger, you know, we, we know we're doing the global equality standard. There's some difficulty with that in the sense that one, it's a one-off kind of project, but we want to keep it going afterwards. And we don't want it to become a tick box every year. We passed it this year, so we'll pass it the following year. We should critique exactly what we passed, what information we actually gathered, was it useful? Is the system really achieving what we're trying to achieve? Um, very particularly on recruitment, we have done um, in work some of the things that other organizations do, but we really are, I think we're pretty rigorous about it, making sure that job ads are suitable for a wider group of people and making sure that plenty of people read the job ads that you are going to send out. What would make them, you know, what's off-putting about that job ad? Traditionally, I think we know some of the stuff that puts women off, you know, there's a list of things. Men read it going, I could do that. I've never done that my whole life, but I'm pretty sure I could get to the moon if you asked me to. And they'll be optimistic about how they're going to get there. Lots of other people will automatically exclude themselves. It's the 101. The big, big, big impact that a lot of organizations have seen when you are interviewing it's not enough to do that once a year, you know, this a training on your, and your biases and everything. It needs to kind of be pointed out before you do the interview pretty regularly because it needs to be front and center to say that you will automatically potentially lean towards your bias. And, it, it, you know, some training program you did six months ago is going to do well, that's another tick box exercise. We got everybody through that and then they forgot all about it. And then it's constantly measuring the results to see who got through and who didn't. Because, again, you are wasting talent if you're not getting those people in the door. Thank you so much, anne -Marie. Super helpful. I think Karen might have some thoughts on this as well. And in the spirit of, again, trying to shoot one yeah. another question in, um, Helen had a supplementary question, which was, um, how can we really tackle unconscious bias when we don't know what we don't know? Unconscious bias is a hot topic, Karen. I'd like to hear your thoughts on that alongside any tips and recruitment. Thank you. Um, uh, absolutely. And um, well, I'll add to Emery's um, and then and, and uh, pivot a little bit to the unconscious bias. Um, once you get people in, um, I think there's a really strong need to think about leadership and progression. Um, in an organization, um, because that's often some of those major blockers where people hit concrete um, around particular kind of roles because they need particular kind of leadership experience or they, they, might, they might need whole organizational experience. So what are you going to do to allow that to happen? What are the mechanisms, formal and informal, to put in place to really actually start to think about growing your leaders for the future? Um, and, 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 and doing that in a very, very focused intentional way um uh which for me is talent management it's it's really quite critical yes karen can i just leap in here because actually tamzin ali balogun has asked any reflections of the role of mentoring in diversity and inclusion programs so it feels like this would be a good good time to weave that into your response yes well I, and and, I, and i'm gonna i'm gonna bring back in unconscious bias um to this because uh i you know i am i am not negative to mentoring or to unconscious bias training. Uh, I, I think they, these are uh, tools and they're mechanisms uh, for both belonging and transformation. I think going back to the point you'd raised before, um, that they, they, they can be, they can serve a whole bunch of different um, roles and, 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 and possibilities, but they are not a magical solution to a whole set of challenges that people are dealing with. Um, and, and often, they need a lot of work to make sure they work. Um, uh, a mentoring program where you just pair people up and you, you hope for the best, um, uh, you know, can, can, can backfire. 
um, where if there are power differentials, if people feel like they are beholden to the folks that they, you know, that they um, uh, are, are, are interacting with, um, it can put a lot of pressure if you uh, have set up a mentoring program, let's say for people of X background and you only have two or three staff members who are of X background at a senior level and then suddenly they're the ones mentoring everybody. And it works the same for reverse mentoring programs where suddenly now you've got folks who've just started in the organization mentoring a CEO um, and trying to explain the experience. So you need to carefully manage those um, in terms of moving them forward and really think about what is the type of relationship? And that's really what those are about. They're about relationships um, and manage, manage those so that they can be productive for people um, and, and transformational. And that is the same for me about unconscious bias training. If you buy a kit off the shelf that gives people a certificate for going through a particular set of training that is measuring their bias ratio, whatever it might be, um, uh, along some set, you're going to get what you pay for in terms of um, uh, you know, what that interaction is and, and what the effects might be. Uh, picking up Anne Marie's point where stuff doesn't last. I mean, the studies are very clear that they, it, it, that they, they, they does not have lasting effects. And, and more importantly, that it may not actually make systems change, it might make people be more aware, um, which is quite helpful, but it might not make systems change when it comes to, let's say things like decision-making. But there is actually some research that is saying that it can confirm for people that their biases are actually <laughs> real and and uh, valid um, because somebody has told them that within in the training so that they don't need to get rid of them. Um, they can just manage them uh, as opposed to not having them. So there's a whole set of things, I think, around these sets of trainings that, again, th th for me, they're not it's not a negative full stop. It's what do you want? What's the purpose of them? What's the kind of culture you're trying to create? What's the work that you want those things to do? Um, and, and then really trying to investigate and put together the right sort of support system and resources to, 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 to get you there. Because nothing's worse than putting together a whole set of trainings, making them mandatory, and people do them, and then they're just, and, and then nothing changes. The culture stays the same. Um, and that's the place to start to think, well, maybe I need to think differently about what, what my problem is. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, all these things can be tools and we should think, how are we using these tools effectively? And I always think the problem with the sort of the, the mindset that people sometimes go into unconscious bias training with is that it's like a it's like a negative if you if you become aware of your biases. But that's the exciting bit, because we all have biases. So if we can start from the expectation that we all have them, we just need to work out how to better understand and, and see the influence that they're having on decisions we're making so forth. That's where you make progress. It's not failure. That's progress. Um, Anne-Marie, I've got a question as well from Coraline, who's asking, in terms of monitoring evaluation, what are your thoughts on surveys and how to increase staff engagement towards initiatives focused on equality, diversity and inclusion? Anne-Marie, what's, what's your experience there? Um, We've, again, there's no magic bullet, I can't say. like doing on, you know, unconscious bias training is not a means to an end. Actually, some of it just highlights the fact we need to do the training and no more. <laughs> we need something bigger and better. I agree. The same thing with mentoring programs. You can just chuck people together and they sit there and, you know, what I would call dance around handbags for the two hours they have to meet every month. And don't, nobody says anything because you know, like, uh, it's awkward, you know. And I, I do think you both need training before you become a mentor and a mentee and to really understand what you're trying to get out of it. I also wouldn't throw people into mentorship programs who aren't ready and don't want to do it because some people just hate the thought of it. Oh, tortures. Um, and I also think being careful about how they've done is super important. I did agree with uh, some of the good CEOs, I think, at this, you know, moved away from going for a pint with people in the evening to having a coffee in the morning because, one, it didn't exclude uh, people who don't drink. Um, mm -hmm. It didn't make it look if they were a man like they were going on a date with a woman. All of those awkwardness, you know, uh, kids to school, just a variety, for a variety of different reasons, they thought about what they were doing. Um, as regards surveys, we have found surveys, and I personally subscribing to surveys in work, have found we, we use a tool, I'm not advertising it particularly, but we find it very useful called PECON, uh, P-E-A-K-O-N, I think it was developed in, in Poland, but we do frequent small snappy surveys and we change the questions pretty frequently and we try to focus them on what we are trying to focus on at that point in time. The annual surveys we did at work were 
oh god it was like torture so we used to beat you know all you need to do is the person who was the most senior beat the person who was down there everybody beat each other up to finish it <laughs> it was really long it was really boring and you couldn't see any results and um the survey now really relies on um if you're going to do a survey get back with some results even if you, and acknowledge that you cannot do it sometimes some of the results and make sure people are adding comments in make sure you frequently come back with comments to people even if you can do nothing people need to be heard so our results feed up into the next level so you don't have just the senior team with thousands of these results that just get lost in the mix you're very particular your own direct reports who are uh, uh, channeling upwards and you're judged on it actually as a, as a senior leader and a lot of the judgment on it if you like as a senior leader you're measured on how well people are filling them in, what they're filling in, what they're saying, and they're anonymous. But it really, it improves management of people. It improves their voice. It makes sure that when you're in those meetings where you have one or two people like me, you might be kind of loud, who will get hurt, but other people won't. And it's another tool. But I would suggest, again, it's not a means to an end. It's not a silver bullet. But I think frequent, short, focused surveys for us have been very useful again trying to measure something and trying to focus on what we're trying to achieve at that time. Thank you Anne-Marie yeah I think the pulse surveys are definitely being explored as a, as a new um, tool again for us to, to see how we can deploy and support this. Now I've got two questions I want to try and smuggle in because we're running out of time amazingly um, I could keep going but I think <laughs> we have to exercise self-discipline here be inclusive people have other things to do with their evenings. Um, so Dr Oli Filayan is saying that getting diverse in the boardroom often requires going beyond mentoring and sponsorship and wants to know if you have examples of sponsorship helping deliver boardroom diversity. So we'll do that one quickly and then I'll come to another question. So Karen, maybe kick off with thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I will. This, this is, this is such, this is a tricky one, uh, especially if we're talking about boardroom and it goes back to that leadership point I was making about kind of talent management um, and, and thinking very carefully about how do you benefit from the participation of a whole range of people at various different levels and skills? Um, one, one, mat, one easy solution is throw out the way you've created your criteria list for your boardroom. Um, that, that it, is, it, it makes a sudden change uh, if you decide that people don't need to have 900 years of experience um, and have been C-suite for 47 years um, to, to then actually you know, uh, uh, bring, bring lots of different sets of folks together. Um, but that that's usually not that's a radical solution uh, and not many places will will take that one on, although although the, we, we're seeing lots of other organizations have a have a, um, a youth director um, uh, on their board of trustees um, or, or having various fo folks from various communities that they interface um, with uh, on, a, on a more consistent basis. Um, I I'm, a, I'm a fan of shadow boards. Mm -hmm. um, I think they can be really quite powerful, um, especially if they have power. Um, and, and they don't just meet, um, but there are things that they can ultimately do um, and, uh, and, and bring up and raise. Um, I think there's other sets of things that, that again, that, 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 that folks have tried out and started to experiment. But I think there's, you know, for me, one of the, one of the key ones is, is really starting to think critically about your criteria um, for, for how you have set up um, um, who and, and, uh, and who gets to participate in your senior leadership. Um, and then the other stuff can flow from that. But if you don't really examine that, you're still taking the same structure and then just trying to figure out how to push people in to match whatever that structure is. And then we get the, the you know, for some type, in some cases, the really uncomfortable fit of people being in a room and thinking, I just feel exposed um, sitting around these sets of folks. I don't, I don't feel like I belong um, or people don't talk to me because they're talking about a set of experiences that I, do, I can't relate to. Um, all the pre-meeting conversation that can happen um, uh, where, where people are, are chatting about things. And, and I think this is, this is where folks who are doing secretariats or board, board work or, or just that sort of support, they gotta start thinking about all of that. It's not just about how to get recruit people to apply. Um, to be a part of it or to, you know, move people up into senior roles where they can sit there. It's really starting to think about those experiences. And again, those relationships, right? 
Great, Karen. Thank you so much. I'm rushing now because I want to get one more question in and then I'm going to come back to you, Karen, and then back to Anne-Marie to give um, a final takeaway for the audience, perhaps something that we can all apply in our working environment or call to action. So my last question I'm going to put to Anne-Marie, then Karen, I'm going to give you your summing up comment. Anne-Marie, um, a question from Robinson Elijah or Elijah Robinson, sorry, I can't tell from this. Uh, he They want to know about AI and... <laughs> whether that's, what role is that going to play in how we handle diversity and inclusion in organisations? Um, so, Amory, I'd love your, your <laughs> thoughts on this enormous question. <laughs> I, I could see Karen's face as well. Um, this is a mine field because, again, if you do not include data, you don't get the data out. So time and time again, when, for example, people were daft enough to use AI, so-called AI, it's the I part of that is the most dubious word but the data they had in actually made sure that when they filtered cvs and they filtered resumes the only people they would have employed were people who were gamers who gamed for hours and hours and hours and hours every day and talk about like chucking most of your population out of any desire to be an engineer or a software engineer at least so it could be terribly terribly exclusionary so I am and you, you know you, you can see ai stuff facial recognition doesn't recognize black faces and doesn't recognize, you know, lots of other will think women are men, men are women. It just it, the word intelligence, people should realize that it is data, data, data. And if it's really well data driven and really well written, it has the potential to work. It also has the, the, the other potential not to work at all. We only have to look at the way some of the stuff is so-called artificial intelligence feeding us the information we get from the internet and making us more siloed and more limited every day and more and more blinkered as opposed to broadening out this great internet we're supposed to you know, all find useful and everything. So yes, it has a significant role to play. Unfortunately, some of the role it is playing is negative and some of it's definitely positive. Thank you, Anne Marie. If you want to have a very brief comment on that, Karen, before you do your summing up, then feel free. I know. To. So, so yeah, briefly, I completely agree with Anne Marie, but I, but I'd also say there's loads of folks who who are interested in, in examining yeah. and critiquing both the ethics of AI, but also some of the problematics with algorithms uh, and various other things. It's a system. It's a system that you know relies upon a a, a, a wide set of inputs. Those inputs can be just as problematic um, that can give you the same result at the end, right? Or even worse. So um, if, if people are moving towards these sorts of mechanisms to as a way to get rid of bias uh, or other sets of things, just stop. <laughs> That's my short answer. Just stop. It's not, it's not, it's not going to magically get you around uh, any of these issues. That's very clear. And so, Carol, I'm going to move you on to your, your final comment. Is there anything you would like to give the audience as their, the, the thing to hold in their heads as they go back to their daily life? Well, I mean, I would just circle back to the points I raised um, when we first started about hope and joy, right? I mean, look at look at this, look at this cast of folks chatting to each other, right? I mean, this is the stuff that makes me happy and it makes me joyful and it and it gives me it gives me hope, it gives me um, excitement. Um, it, you know, it feeds me when I feel frustrated, uh, or uncertain about anything, <laughs> um, especially looking at my inbox. Um, but more, but more importantly, I think it also galvanizes me because I'm, I, again, back to the point I raised about being on the shoulders of giants. I realize that I'm walking hand in hand with co-conspirators who are fantastic. Um, and that means, you know, we, 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 we are always much bigger than what we think we are, right? When we're, we're thinking about our roles and the work we're doing in isolation from each other, but we actually are a collective. Um, we, we don't necessarily have to call ourselves a community of practice, um, but, but we are one. And, and the more we can expose ourselves to the thinking and the creativity um, and the passion, uh, but, but also the tenacity, I think, of folks who are continuing to move on and think about the histories that give rise to this, the more I think we can, we can, we can, we can tackle all of this. So don't feel daunted by the bigness of any set of issues. Take it small, chunk it up, whatever you need to do, um, and reach out and find your co-conspirators who can walk this journey with you. Amazing, Karen. And I need to now turn to your co-conspirator, Anne-Marie, to make sure you have the opportunity for a final message for our audience. Well, for, I would just, um, you know, uh, uh, say everything Karen said makes complete sense to me. And I would I would take it, you know, even, even for, not even further, actually, just to say to people, I think we've said it before now, it's not to be afraid to start to do something. 
it is this thing you cannot start you need to take a step it's like how do you run a marathon you know people say to you like well you got to start moving one foot in front of the other is kind of key how do you write a book well the word is right start doing so i'm a great believer in starting to do something measure it and don't be frightened to keep because to develop a system you're going to keep changing you're going to keep adapting you're going to keep moving forward and like karen i'm full of hope because i'm lucky enough like all of many of us here to be involved in technology that it's having such a huge sometimes negative but to me the potential for positive impact in the world is just massive in terms of technology actually ai can be a great force for good machine learning vision systems be just simply being able to shop online it it's all gives hope it's all quite provided it's available to as many of us as possible it's it's wonderful. So I have great hope for planet Earth, and I have great hope because actually all of us again are here today talking about it, and it matters to us. Thank you so much, honestly, both of you, for such an uplifting and illuminating discussion. Um, I I really think you've you've done an amazing job of of, of tackling um, such an important topic, but in such a holistic way. And I'd like to also thank our fantastic contributors um, who have pose their questions and engage with this discussion. Uh, I really appreciate all of your support and engagement and your, your contributions to this, to this effort to, to be inspired by diversity and inclusion and also to play our part in ensuring that it's not a project and that we show up with all our creativity and our collaboration and our curiosity to try to make sure that, you know, when we look back five years hence, we can tell the story of positive change and we'll be able to measure some of that progress too. So we hope that today's discussion has enabled you all to identify some useful pointers for how to approach diversity inclusion in the workplace and to understand in more depth how diversity inclusion supports all of our experience and the delivery, really importantly, of better engineering outcomes. Today's conversation is the start of a full year of activities at the Academy focused on this topic of what works. And that includes the Academy's annual Diversity and Inclusion Conference on the 15th of March. And we're going to hear lots more from other outstanding leaders and innovators in this space. So if this conference has left you keen to delve deeper into this topic, please do register to join that conference via our website, via the Academy's website. And if you have any further comments about today's event, please respond to the survey that will have been dropped into the chat about now and will also be emailed to you following the event because your feedback helps us to continuously improve and make sure that we are being inclusive in how we run our events. And do come back for future critical conversations. You'll find them on our LinkedIn page. But for now, thank you again to our amazing speakers, Dr. Karen Salt and Anne-Marie Neatham. We've really enjoyed your contributions and we look forward to being co-conspirators on that journey. So thank you so much and thank you all for joining us. Have a fantastic evening, everyone. Thank you.